and or maybe it's a food. And um, what actually makes me very happy that since my last visit in 2015, um, Filipinos have much more access to financial inclusion. Actually, their growth has been from 17% in 2015 to 56% uh, about two years ago. And I'm sure the number is actually even bigger when we actually make a new measurement. We've been speaking about a lot of things in the last uh, few days. Uh, first of all, affordability of these services. And what we mean by that is uh, most of these services are not being done not only by a branch in a bank, but actually on the mobile phone. And uh, so being able to pay that service means that you know the payment has to be very, very low prices. And at the same time, we are depending on the connectivity. Do I have a connection? And is that connection affordable? We've also been speaking about these issues as well. We've also been speaking about the implementation of ID. Without an ID, I cannot open an account. So it's very important that every Filipino has an ID so that your banks can actually open an account. Otherwise, there's no way that we can actually make financial inclusion possible. We've also been talking about basically issues like um, interoperability of payments to increase competition. Um, without competition, there will be no innovation. And we need that innovation. We need that innovation to develop new types of insurance. We need that innovation to develop new types of credit for productive uh, purposes. And we need that innovation to actually help every Filipino in their own reality know places where they are. So it's been very fruitful discussions. And again, let me thank, above all, uh, the Bancos and Dallas Filipinas for this amazing work and, and for preparing my visit so well that has led to many fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Majesty. Um, Very important that every Filipino had an ID so that your banks can actually open that account. Otherwise, there's no way that we can actually make financial inclusion possible. We've also been talking about basically issues like um, interoperability of payments to increase competition to get access. But also, the 57 today have much more usage. Some of them only use it for just the payments. And they don't really use it to make sort of real savings or having better access to other things. So it's not only the, the, the basically the whole access, but the depth and the breadth uh, that we also need to cater. So um, it goes with. And actually, um, I think what I would like every leader to have is to have a choice between different providers of insurance companies, different providers of payment companies, different providers of credit, and that enhance competition. Thank you. Thank you, Your Majesty. Thank you, Governor. Thank you to the members of the press. Thanks. Also savings and insurance, and also productive credit. Um, and this issue what you know, the governor just mentioned of financial health is very important. Now, what is financial health? Financial health is defined by four elements. One is your ability to make fun to day-to-day -day expenses. Number two is to be able to have a long-term vision and, you know, is education, is having a house, is retirement for your pension day, how you're going to cope for uh, not having an income after you turn 60, for example. Third, how do you make fun in case of a shock? A shock can be sickness, can be loss of typhoon, can be also having an accident. And fourth, and then we actually ensure that you long-term savings. And fourth, are you confident enough in order to juggle this financial life in the short term, medium, and the long term? And for that is, everything this actually has budgeting tools, having knowledge to actually, uh, um, you know, view, how to sort of view or prepare for the future. All these issues I will actually give you confidence. So uh, we've been talking with, uh, with the governor about financial health is already included in the national inclusion strategy. But how do we measure it? And how do we measure it in terms of not only from a you know, government perspective to all of the Filipinos, but also every private sector member, how do they measure their clients so as to help them increase the savings, to help them having budgeting tools to see, okay, what are my monthly expenses? Am I spending too much in the clothing? Am I, am I spending too, too little on, on savings? And to start helping and guiding the consumers and all the citizens in the Philippines to have actually better sort of financial their lives. Um, having said that, in the main parts of the Philippines, 
I don't even get with financial products, so I can't even think about having them, them financially healthy, so I have to get them, get them first. And um, one of the things is that we see that the cost of actually uh, connectivity is still very high, and the quality of uh, connectivity is not very good. So one of the messages to the government have been that connectivity is a very important item. Uh, we, we need to really go to the poorest and to the most distant places, we need to make a lot of investments jointly with the private sector uh, to basically improve connectivity, the quality, the speed, but also reduce the prices. On the other hand, that, or on top of that, um, or part of that, that's how we're also going to make payments also more affordable for people. I'm not saying that everything should be given free because that's not realistic. We have to have a sustainable service that actually is being in place. But there's a lot of room to improve the pricing of the payment system, certainly from person to person and person to merchants. So um, yesterday I was, uh, or the day before yesterday, I was visiting in uh, in Tallinn Island uh, in Laguna Bay, uh, and there was this uh, fisherman, and he was telling me that if, now that he has connectivity and that he had an agent there that he can actually deposit and you know take money from his account, he said. That is saving me so much time and money. I used to have to pay three dollars to get into the boat from the river to the mainland. Then all the costs of the day that I had to spend there to make a payment, I then come back. And now I can do it here. I can do it my phone and I can do it here. So, and this is the whole day that I'm not, you know, missing from all being on my family and being on my business. So basically, money that I will be using anyway. So. This is the type of thing that we need to do. Um, and it was, it was really very nice. Uh, he was also saying to me that with the credit that he actually got, he had increased his income by three times in only two years. So this is the type of environment we want to see in the future. And we want to make this possible for many, many more Filipinos. We're now making possible 57% of Filipinos. We want to make this possible, hopefully, for 100% of all Filipinos. Thanks, Your Majesty. I'll come back in case you have a follow-up later, but we'll ask other questions first. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Governor, and good afternoon, Your Majesty. I'm Mia Reyes from NMA Philippines. Um, I understand that this um, advocacy is a pro-poor advocacy. And my question is, how can private and government sectors do to prosper, to prosper financial inclusions? Thank you. Um, what we want is a vision, and we know that financial inclusion is not only pro growth but pro poor. That means it actually helps people, like the example I just gave to you, uh, to increase its income and to have you also have health insurance, by the way, and you have also accident insurance. So when he gets into an accident while you know doing his job, his family is going to get you know the amount of days he could actually get an income or you know being able to spend, to to pay the, the health bills. This is very important because it's not only getting out of poverty, but staying out of poverty. So maybe this man, he worked so hard to actually um, uh, you know, get his income uh, on the investments, all the days that he spends in his company, but you know, he has one accident and they have to send everything to pay for his help. And then they start all over again. They go back into poverty. So it's not only that's why this whole issue of financial health has to be encompassing. It's to help people, you know, not only in the day to day finances increase their income, but also to protect their income sources and protect their livelihoods, you know, along the time. Um, so we know that financial inclusion is very important. Now, um, that's why it's not only focusing on just credit. That's why insurance is very important. That's why savings is very important. And it's not, you know, emergency savings, also long-term savings. We've actually been having a conversation um, with Peter about, you know, the pension, the possibility of the long-term savings, so when you retire. Um, these are issues that actually allow you sort of intergenerational sort of creation of wealth for all of you people, not for just a few. So um, I would say that this is extremely important. But now, if you took if you are telling me, so you know, how does the private sector, uh, together with the public sector, sort of organize this? Well, first of all, you have to have access to all these products. And how do you actually have access to these products? Today, the most 
efficient way is through your mobile phone, of course, and with agents, right? So you actually, yourself, I'm sure, have access to. And that actually has been possible. If we actually had said, you know, before, you know, I have to put a battle branch in every island here in the Philippines, more than 7,000 islands, nobody can pay for that. But by having this, we can actually make it possible. That means the connectivity has to be much more affordable and much better quality. Say that you actually send your mother some money, and in the middle of sending that money, the communication, the connectivity falls, and you don't know what happened with that money. Is it going to give you trust? So this quality of connectivity is also very important. So I think that's the first part in which private sector and public sector have to come in agreement of actually making an investment of actually reaching all the population with an affordable connection system. Um, and then, on top of that comes the banks, and all of the financial service providers that would actually, on that connectivity, will build up that you know, um, provision of uh, financial services to you. Also, there has to be the right uh, price. Also, that has to be not only for payments, it also has to be how to help you save that time. What are your desires? What are your needs? How do I help you actually sort of go through the whole month of actually making uh, ends meet? Because you maybe get a salary every month, but most of the Filipinos actually are informal workers and they get every maybe 20 days some money. But they have expenses going all the time. So how do I bridge that? So how do I help the people? So I think uh, the private sector has a lot, a lot to do in terms of redesigning products as to match the needs of the customers. And having this constant dialogue and learning from each other uh, will be extremely important in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Third question. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. Good afternoon, Government. Um, Ricardo Flores of Reuters. Um, Your Majesty, how has global inflation and tighter monetary policy and higher borrowing costs derailed or slowed efforts to uh, deepen access to financial services? And what efforts do you think are needed to get it back on track? And also on artificial intelligence. So I didn't ask, uh, answer the last part. What efforts are needed uh, to get um, to get efforts to deepen um, access to finance and to be back on track? And also on artificial intelligence, I think you've mentioned in past speeches that uh, AI uh, has benefits, but it also could further exclude people rather than widen financial inclusion. So um, how would you assess you know, governance efforts of uh, central banks and other regulators to make sure that the benefits of AI are felt by those at the margins? Well, I think that part of the response, uh, um, certainly on the macroeconomic side, uh, could be responded by you. If you have very high inflation, uh, saving in your own currency will be you know, not very sustainable. So um, whatever we do, a stable macroeconomic policy is extremely important. And uh, um, at the same time, you know, the central bank and the monetary policy has to be there to actually stabilize the macroeconomic situation. So. Um, Definitely, there's incentives and disincentives to save, to borrow, and all these things. But I would say that, you know, in general, we need to in a stable macroeconomic uh, environment. Uh, for these, for financial inclusion, they're not financial help to thrive. That's, that's for sure. Um, on, on the issue of uh, AI, and I would like to extend that to anything being digital. Um, like I said, Digital has actually given us the opportunity to actually reach much more people in a much more affordable way. Yeah? So uh, what happens that before any, like I said before, any bank building a brick and mortar uh, branch and sending agents to sort of in a place where not many people live, it's, it was just not affordable for anybody, not even a state bank. So um, digitalization has given us the opportunity to actually be, have a bank branch in your home. In the, in the palm of your hands. That's, that's great, that's amazing. Now, it also um, has, every, every type of benefit has also its risks. And the risks are that, you know, for example, uh, if you're not digitally literate, you're gonna be excluded. If you don't have connectivity, you're also gonna be excluded. If you don't have, if you couldn't afford a smartphone, you're also gonna be excluded. So, um, of course, there's less exclusion than before, because of course we now have, you know, still 40% of the Filipinos are excluded, before it was 80%, so it has actually helped us. But I think we have to be mindful 
um, that um, that every benefit has its risk, and we we have to sort of you know think about it. In terms of AI, even going deeper into it, um, so what AI does is looking at algorithms, mostly of the past. So in the past, we've been looking at you know how um, some you know people in Manila do their business because those have been you know the clients in the past. They would they would not be able to translate that into or a fisherman or uh, you know somebody doing some you know agriculture very far away from Manila. Their reality is going to be different, and it might actually not give the right sort of offerings to the people. In that sense, those are also the risks. So we need to also be very mindful whether we actually um, use AI and algorithms to ask the right questions. So I think there are ways to go around it, but we have to be very mindful about it. Um, and there's also other issues in terms of risks. Um, it is, we were talking about open finance. Open finance is the possibility that uh, that you have today, you have all your data inside of, you know, a bank has a, a, a part of your data, Google has a part of your data, it is your data. And with open finance, you would actually have access to that data to actually maybe have a better offering for a mortgage house credit. Now, it's still your data, and nobody can misuse it. So the use of data also needs a lot of uh, thinking and um, uh, a lot of safety uh, and uh, having standards on how we uh, exchange data. And, and I take this very, very seriously because it's about trust. And it's about, if you have to have trust in the system, it will never work. Um, so in a nutshell, every benefit has its risk and the risks have to be uh, uh, basically uh, measured and, uh, and actually you know, regulated. Thank you. Thank you, Your Majesty. Governor, would you like to comment on uh, McCaff's question about the effect of inflation and financial inclusion or, or uh, what the Queen said about digital? Let me just say, inflation is bad. It's bad for, <laughs> for uh, financial inclusion, it's bad for financial health. You want stable prices, but to do a lot of work. Uh, but let me add to what Her Majesty said about open finance. It is a new concept in the Philippines, especially that uh, open finance means. Uh, there is a platform uh, of what we call an API. Uh, this is Keisha Bassett from the Philippine Star. Um, my question is for the governor. Her Majesty earlier said that 70% is not 100%. So do you think it's possible to have 100% of all Filipino adults to be onboarded into the formal financial system? Um, do you think this is possible during your term? And what are the challenges that we may face? There's homework and there's deadlines.